we're excited to do a quick panel on selecting a great portfolio of hedge fund managers from uh, distinguished groups of limited partners in the space and advisors. Um, you all know who's on the panel, but I thought everyone could briefly introduce yourselves and talk about uh, where you work, what types of managers you allocate to, and, and on behalf of whom. Uh, personally, my name is Lawrence Delevang. I'm a reporter with Reuters in New York. I've covered alternative investing for a while, uh, particularly hedge funds at a magazine called Absolute Return and later at CNBC. Um, so please, uh, Amit, if you could begin. Sure. Um, can everybody hear me well? All right. Um, hi, I'm Amit Soni. I'm a director and portfolio manager in the multi-asset solutions team at New York Life Investments. Our team manages around $10 billion uh, across various multi-asset portfolios, both for retail and institutional clients. Our team does a lot of quant research. We do allocate to internal managers running both traditional and alternative hedge fund strategies. And we also uh, collaborate with our product team in assessing external fund managers uh, who we may collaborate with in the future. I'm Mike Weinberg. Um, uh, well, I've seen concerts here, but first time I've been on stage. Uh, um, in any case, um, I'm, I'm with APG, uh, Dutch Pension Asset Manager. Uh, first of all, the, I just have to read a brief disclaimer, which is um, the views I'm sharing today are mine, and we only have one client and are not looking for other clients. Um, that said, um, true, we, we take compliance very strictly. Um, anyway. Um, uh, so, uh, our, it's publicly filed that our portfolio is $500 billion, and um, uh, our hedge fund portfolio also publicly filed is about $25 billion. Uh, I'll pause there. I also teach as an adjunct professor at Columbia Business School. I'm Elisa Mailman. I'm Chief Investment Officer of a fund of funds called E Street Management. We invest in long short equity managers that are committed to staying small. Great. Huh. Woohoo! <laughs> Uh, Liz Holtman, I'm uh, Chief Investment Officer of Barlow Partners, Inc., which has evolved over time, but uh, it was a, a fund of funds of long short equity funds, and today I work with a couple of uh, institutions um, as clients as well as I sit on some investment committees of nonprofits. Great. Uh, so I, I have lots of questions for you all as, as a nosy journalist about how to construct a great portfolio of hedge funds, which strategies are going to outperform. But, but I want to start at a high level, if each of you could talk about what the case is for hedge funds as an asset class. Mike, do you want to start? Sure, sure. So, um, um, our, our view actually um, was historically hedge funds were an asset class, but our views come to evolve where we view them more as parts of asset classes now. Um, that so so um, we're looking at them as as so for example equity hedge funds we look at within the equity asset class and but but I think that that may be too technical and the answer you're for, for, forget the asset class part but what what is the case for hedge funds in the portfolio today so, yeah sorry sorry so um, the the case for hedge funds is I think the same as it's been for many years at least for us which is uh, uncorrelated alpha driven returns that complement our largely beta driven portfolio. Um, and, and um, for example, downside protection in years like uh, 2008, where long only indices like the S&P are down 40, and hedge funds do certainly uh, orders of magnitude better than that. Yep. Liz, you, you've been investing in this space for a long time. Do you, are you still as excited about the ability for hedge funds to deliver as it were, you know, say 10 years ago? You know, um, I guess I would, I'm wishful thinking. I'd like it like to be able to say yes, but I think that if you look at, you divide the world from pre-crisis, pre-08 to now, and going forward, I would say that the expectations for hedge funds or alternative strategies I don't think are as great as we used to think, but again, I don't think we're going to see returns in the public markets and long-only strategies or anything else. I mean, I think we're all looking to find, you know, higher returns. So I still think there's a real value for, for hedge funds in a portfolio, as, as what Mike was just saying, is that it's pretty hard. We've had a 12-year bull market, so it's hard to say in recent times that they've added a lot of value. But 
you know, I think that you know, the, the, the long history that's there, I think that there is still uh, an opportunity for, there's definitely a role for them in, a, in the context of a whole portfolio. Yeah, I would just yeah. add to what Liz is saying. I mean, I, um, I think Liz and I met about 16 years ago and, uh, you know, returns of certain le levels of returns have come down, down over time as I think markets have become more efficient and, um, and um, you know, uh, industry assets have grown immensely. So it's, it's clearly more difficult, but that said, for example, you know, certainly managers that we are involved with and know are, are, are meeting or beating their targets and, and doing as we would expect them to be. Yeah. I mean, in, in your sort of quantitative assessment of client portfolios, are you seeing some good data signals for where hedge funds may be able to outperform going forward? Um, so, yeah, that's actually an interesting question because uh, we try to say that like you, if there's a good absolute return or hedge fund strategy, you shouldn't be able to predict when it should be able to outperform because all the underlying signals that are making uh, or driving returns here should not be driven by whether risk on, risk off characteristics that a macro environment can generally uh, point toward and you can position in and out of equities or bonds that's something that should not be driving your absolute return or hedge fund strategies. And that's why it's really hard to predict which one will do good or not. Yep. Uh, so we always say have exposure to a diversified set of alternative strategies. Though you can, you know, in some cases you can uh, make those assessments. You know, some strategies do have a net beta bias and you can adjust those, but otherwise have a diversified expo exposure overall. Yep. Elisa, I'll, I'll throw you the, the derivative question of the case for hedge funds. Um, you work at a fund of hedge funds. W what is the case for both today? So, you know, a fund of hedge funds where we have found has been the most useful are for people or small institutions where you might not necessarily be able to have the access, the manpower to go find a diversified group of hedge funds where you know you want to be in the hedge funds, but you don't know where to get them. You know you don't want to be in the really, really big funds, but that's all you know. So where do you go to find ones? Because everyone says smaller hedge funds outperform over time, which is why we chose managers that committed to staying small, because then we don't have to worry about them getting too big. Um, and so the case, I think, for fund of funds, whether it be a multi-strat or, in our case, single strategy, is that, you know, a lot of investors don't have the manpower or the wherewithal to go out and find a whole portfolio of hedge funds on their own. And so you hire one person to do it for you. Great. So you all are probably getting 100 emails a day from managers saying, I, I have the best strategy for 2020. Just look at my Sharpe ratio and my asset um, allocation and, you know, I'm going to be great for you. Um, Tell me, what, what strategies are you most excited about for, for next year? Is it global macro? Is it long, short equity? Is it credit? What looks good? Um, yeah. Go ahead. So uh, it's on the same lines as the previous question. I would like to be in a diversified set of uh, alternative strategies, but would stay away from uh, strategies, maybe something like long bias, long short equity, which has a net beta bias. I think it's in line with so what some other panelists said on the earlier panels today. Okay. Yeah. I, we're, so we are, um, we're quite diversified across strategies as well. Credit, uh, equities, fixed income, <clears throat> macro, relative value, um, other, other finance strategies. Um, that said, what we generally do is we try to look at our existing long only, again, more beta driven portfolio, which is the vast majority of our portfolio, and complement it with strategies that may or may, may, or may not be available uh, to the long only managers. And um, so, so our hedge fund portfolio, you could almost look at as a completion portfolio in some respects to our lar much larger long only portfolio. Any specifics though? I mean, are you really bullish on global macro, say? Um, well, I mean, I can, so a personal view is, look, as Elizabeth mentioned, uh, we've been in a 12-year, um, or Liz mentioned, we've been in a 12-year bull market, um, or almost 12-year bull market, whatever the number is at th this point in time. Uh, markets are hitting new highs by the day. Things are pretty frothy. We haven't had a material recession, pullback, bear market in some time. I mean, to me, that would imply that one would want to be in more hedged, um, 
neutral strategies or strategies that would perhaps fare better in adverse market conditions. Um, that, that would be my inclination. Okay. Uh, so yes. I would just say that one of the reasons that I think all of us have been attracted to investing in absolute return hedge fund type strategies is that if you try to differentiate a long short manager, for instance, from long only, it's because they know how to short. They know how to make money on the short side. And I think, I don't know, I'll speak for myself that I'm attracted to managers who actually uh, identify shorts as a profit center as opposed to just as a hedging strategy. And I think actually going forward that, I mean, think about, we've all we read ad nauseum in the papers about disruption going on. I think that there are certain sectors in the, ma in the, in the market right now, such as the life sciences and the technology, TMT, broadly defined, that have a ton of things going on, lots of new um, uh, um, companies, um, lots of dispersion. And that's what long short managers in particular love, is lots of dispersion, lots of opportunity on the long side, and lots of opportunities on the short side. So I would say, although I probably sound like a broken record because that's the space I'm in, is that it's a, it should be a great opportunity for long short managers that take a fundamental approach that really understand their sectors. I mean, we invest only in long short, so obviously I would agree with Liz, but you know, to quote one of my managers, it really should never be a bad time for long short equity. There's always companies doing well, and there's always companies doing poorly, and not all bad company stocks go up when they report bad earnings. Um, and so, and now, but add now that there's more, we're seeing more dispersion, it does make the opportunity set better. What makes it interesting now, and a lot of managers would say, is there's a lot of overreaction now, both on the upside and on the downside to earnings, which can give, it can hurt you, it can help you, it can give you more opportunity set. But it, as, again, as our, a lot of our, manage, um, our managers have said, it's never really a bad time. Um, when there's not a lot of market vol, it doesn't mean that there's not a lot of stock and sector vol. So, you know, and going forward, more dispersion will help more. At, at the risk of being overly re re repetitive, uh, which may be redundant, but, um, you know, our are, um, we, we're looking for managers who generate profit on both sides of the portfolio. Um, again, that is the, we believe, the core value of this proposition uh, to complement our immense long only portfolio. So um, we, we, we do look for managers who generate alpha on both sides of the portfolio and aren't merely hedged with um, market indices or blunt indices or um, beta. Can I just, Please. I think maybe, Lawrence, you're looking for the, the elephant in the room. You were looking for us to all say it's time for global macro, perhaps, you know, given everything that's going on in the world, you would think that this would be an excellent time. And I've never had a great luck with ma global macro, so I'm reluctant to suggest that because every time I look for global macro, the, it, there's just not consistency in, in the kinds of managers I'm looking for for the institutions. I'm involved, but if you can find there are, not to say that there aren't great global macro out there, it's just a really tough area to get your hands around, and I'm sure everybody's had experience there. Yeah, I mean, I was a portfolio manager at Soros, um, immensely familiar with global macro as a strategy as well, and yeah, I mean, the issue is, right, you're looking for managers who hit home runs effectively, right, and uh, so you, you know, it's not like a manager that's trying to generate profit on a daily or weekly or monthly basis, so it is more difficult because you have many fewer observations and data points to prove statistical significance versus luck. Sorry, just, but I think the other reason is, in, is that if you think about the great um, risk arbitrage, um, global macro managers, they learned on large institutional money, whether it was at a big bank like Goldman or at Harvard, you know, Harvard College or wherever, there's not the same kind of training, in my opinion, that's going on the way at least I learned about global macro. And so I just think there's, there's not as much, there's not as many people who have had um, the ability to have ex great experience in being a global macro manager. Yeah, I, I think it's also become more difficult for some of those managers because markets have become more efficient over time. You, had, you know, in 2000, I remember I was PM, Reg, Reg FD came out and regulation, you know, full disclosure where every companies have to disclose the same information to all participants at the same time. and. You have the internet now and so much data that managers were able to get through their mosaic theory and due diligence now is commoditized and on the internet and available to everyone at the same time. Yeah, but by the same token, what else are you avoiding? What, what types of strategies and attributes, say, within long short equity scare you in, in, in a manager 
for the next couple of years? I think we're more stable and consistent in terms of looking for managers. It, it's like a comment um, we, you know, f from a minute ago. We're looking for managers that consistently uh, can generate, have a consistent repeatable process to generate alpha and returns on an annual basis, sort of irrespective of what the markets are doing. I mean, it's not to say uh, that there aren't better times and worse times for strategies, but we're not trying to actively, aggressively time strategies and like that. Got it. So, I don't know, if, Alyssa, do you invest in managers that will invest in the private equity area? Will no. no, it's purely public. So here's my latest pet peeve on, on this space, is, and it's not, an, it's not my idea, but is that we see a lot of money going into the private equity world, into illiquid securities, and that there's this huge, um, you, know, a, you know, trillions of dollars going into the private equity world, and we're seeing fewer and fewer publicly traded companies, that there are many of them are going private, we don't have as many, and I just think that between the quantitative investing uh, there's price discovery is not as robust as it used to be. And so you could probably say both sides of that could be attractive for really good long short managers. But things just don't trade like they used to. And so I think that's, a, it's not really a strategy to invest in, but I think it's a consideration that we're all dealing with is that when we look at managers, there's so many of them that are so tempted to invest in the private markets. Well, I've got a different, similar take on Liz's point. It, with, so in terms of private credit, for example, what I've observed is many managers have launched, they've raised an immense amount of capital. Um, they, those are generally long only. Um, there's no short side there. Um, and they don't necessarily have the l duration of experience through an adverse credit cycle or the ability to do workouts. Um, and I think that that is a threat to investors' returns prospectively, where you have managers investing in credit with no uh, history or experience in workouts and what happens when it does go wrong in the next, invariably in the next recession, downturn, uh, adverse economic cycle, which at some point should happen, I would think. Okay, so, so if you're not wildly chasing new strategies every six months as I'm trying to prod you into, what are some best practices on constructing a really good balance portfolio of hedge funds that will outperform over a, a multi-year cycle? I can take that one. So yeah, actually, our group has done a lot of research on constructing portfolios uh, with alternatives, which have hedge fund strategies in it. And it becomes really important here to make the right uh, adjustments to the traditional risk factors that you, you look at when constructing portfolios, whether it's in a mean variance, risk-based rates, risk parity, whatnot. Uh, but it's more important to make these adjustments here because the cost of making an error is much higher here. And that's because your dispersion among managers uh, is much higher, which is the, the, we call it the manager performance dispersion risk. And, um, uh, and that's not the case with traditional uh, asset classes when you're constructing portfolios with them. So in a, if you take an example of private equity, uh, and, and the same thing applies to hedge fund strategies as well, but it's just a good uh, comparison with uh, public equities. So you know, if you want to invest in private equity because you want that excess return, which, you know, just say like 3% annually over the long term over public equities, uh, so you go ahead, find a manager, and invest in private equity. And um, you know, your odds are that you'll 50-50 chance you'll pick a median manager, but despite all your best efforts, you can end up with a 75th percentile manager. And it's not a disaster, you know, 50 to 75th percentile can happen to anybody. But the problem here is that even though your median private equity manager has a 3% uh, excess return over public equity, your 75th percentile manager is very likely to be below the 75th percentile manager of public equity because in traditional asset classes like private, in public equities, the managers have a very set benchmark which they are managing their portfolio, their over underweight against. So they're all very narrowly concentrated around the benchmark so you don't have as much risk there. While in something like private equity or you know, global macro has a very high manager performance dispersion risk, um, 
this risk can be much higher, and you need to incorporate this into your risk metric when you are constructing your you know, quantitative portfolios. Whether you do subjective overlay later on is a different question, but you need to take this risk, you need to quantify this risk and incorporate it when you are doing your risk parity portfolio, your mean variance, your min wall portfolio. And it's the same case with hedge fund strategies, and it can vary a lot. Yeah. Yeah, like global macro has a, like the, the standard deviation of managers in global macro is almost 10%. In traditional equities, it's 1.5%. In private equity, it's 9%. So these numbers are huge, and we need to make sure that we take this into account. Literally, how do you track that stuff? Do you have a some overload spreadsheet? Do you buy a fancy piece of software that takes care of all the data for you? Uh, yeah, so for, for any hedge fund strategies, you can go to like Morningstar or HFRI. There are a lot of data providers, and you can look at the distribution of returns over a long term. Just like, you know, you look at the volatility as the time series risk of returns. This yeah. is your cross-sectional risk across managers. Uh, so you can look at the cross-sectional volatility of performance of managers in any hedge fund strategy okay. where you have the data available. Now, in private equity, it becomes harder because you don't have like clear time series of individual managers. So what you can do is you can look at these percentile. We usually get data from... Uh, Cambridge Associates, it's an alternative okay. data provider. Okay. We just we can get it for free from their website. And um, yeah, you, you look at their 75th and 25th percentile numbers, and you assume uh, a normal distribution of that, and then you can derive what is the standard deviation of that distribution, and then you plug it in in your portfolio construction process, whatever that is. I see, I yeah. see. What are the best practices for <laughs> portfolio construction? Well, we're super fancy. We um, pretty much equally weight everything. Um, and there's two managers in our portfolio that do not get that weighting for individual reasons. And for every new dollar we take in, we start who's underperforming and why, because that's where we want to go first. But other than that, we since we're long short equity only, we don't want to take the guessing as to who's going to do better going forward. We want to take that out of our hands, because there's really no way to predict you know, our best performer last year was because it's very low net and returned double digits last year. You know, one of our worst performers last year is, um, our second best performer last year is our worst performer this year. Very, very stock specific. So we didn't know if that, who, we would have never been able to predict that that was coming. So because they're all equity managers, we pretty much equally weighted except for individual reasons why not. I would just, I would, I would, I'm going to go back to the, Liz's comment again from the previous and your question, what's going to be challenging? I'm going to add it, give a different answer as well on the private side, which I, I think we're starting to see it now with what's transpired with WeWorks. And um, I, I think, you, you know, if, you, if, if one just looks at a list of unicorns, um, that there's going to be a lot of um, markdowns in, in, in a list of, of unicorns. Um, prospectively, I, I was portfolio manager I mentioned at Soros during the first tech bubble. And um, a lot of this reminds me of that, um, where you have companies that are money losing, funded by VCs, funded by investors at ever increasing markups. And, um, and uh, you know, that, that game works until it doesn't, and then it goes the other way. And it, it's, it's reflexive on the way up, and it's reflexive on the way down. And um, I, I think that will be a, uh, I, I think it's, it's different this time. It, it's only different this time in that it's, it's more narrow and it's not as broad in the market. but. I do think that um, a lot of investors, both institutional and um, and, and non-institutional, will will be quite surprised to, to see this go the other way. Yeah, ha have revaluations of private companies like a WeWork hit your hedge fund portfolio at all, or is that really a, a separate issue for more liquid? Yeah, no, we we we're, it has not because. Um, Th those we're, that's not what we're doing. We're, those, those are sort of speculative venture capital, uh, illiquid, private. That, that's not what we're, that's sort of the antithesis of we're, what we're doing. Um, we're more involved in um, publicly traded, large cap securities that are generally very, we're generally very long-term investors. They're generally, there's, there could be some growth or value orientation, but that, that's not what we're doing. I'm sure a lot of long short managers were just salivating at, at the WeWork IPO and hoping they went public at 60 billion and then the shorts would come out, but so it goes. Uh, what, what else? 
I mean, our managers don't do private. That's something that we're very um, specific about. We don't want our managers um, having, you know, where they can have an allocation to privates. Um, we don't want them to even be tempted. Um, one of them does, you know, little used to be a little bit 144A. We have one that will do pre-IPO, but they know the IPO is, you know, within 12 months. Um, and where they source their, those ideas is a unique situation. But we don't want anyone to be tempted by anything private. So there's no you know, allocation to privates in any of their fund, in any of our funds. I mean, it's, a, it's a lot of work when you have a manager who decides to do private and it's worth spending a lot of, some time with a manager trying to understand why they are doing private. And you can understand what we just saying before about the private world that there's, you can learn a lot about these private companies that apply that information to your analysis on the publicly traded stuff. But when you get down to a portfolio construction, it can really um, hamper things, especially I think in a fund of funds format, because then you've got illiquidity issues, you've got side pocket issues, you've got investors who want their money, and then how do you think? How do you decide about where does that? How does that private get allocated or distributed? Um, it just create and then valuation issues. If you've got to come up with a monthly NAV, it's really hard to get private, you know, uh, data on that on that part of the portfolio. So it, it just creates another element of of, of um, not only work on the on the investor side, but also at the manager side. You just try to understand why are they spending five or ten percent of their time on ten percent. Let's say no, f spending all this time on five to ten percent of the portfolio when the rest of it is really what's going to drive the performance ultimately. And so I think I'm in agreement that if we had our druthers, we would not like to see that. And so now you're seeing a lot of, many of your hedge funds that you offer a share class where you can opt out of investing in the private so that you have investors to do that. But I think it's the concern is, is the time element um, spent on private. Especially like we would always opt out. And so here our manager is spending X amount of time on investments that we don't even get the benefit of. So we don't want anyone that's going to be tempted to do that. Well, I think there was a very high profile launch within the last year or two, right, that um, had an outsized position in Juul. And I could be mistaken, but I think that was, that was required if you were an investor. And again, it looked brilliant on the way up. And now with the recent markdown, I think it's maybe not looking as brilliant. And I think that was far in excess of 10% as, as right. much as 20, 30% of the portfolio. Right. Yep. Right. So, so it sounds like style drift in, into private could, 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 has been an issue in the past. Um, yeah, it's been a, I mean, yeah, we've seen it even before the, well, I mean, it, even before, yeah, I mean, exactly. It's like, there's always been this, right? It, right. It, so, so, so my, my look, it's in long only too, right? Sorry, Lawrence. In, uh, in long only mutual funds, right? Like the Fidelities and the, um, the T-Rows, thank you. And the, all, a lot of these managers were doing this as well, right? In long only daily liquidity mutual funds investing in these, all the deals we're talking about at, at until recently, at higher valuations. And there, you, you, did you do an article on this or it was other friends of ours? Yeah, uh, yeah. At, at some point, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. No, it, was, it was the party everyone wanted to get into. Right. And that's where the alpha was, supposedly. And now we're seeing a bit of a blowback. So just to take the opposite end of the spectrum, we are also seeing the use of ETFs a lot in portfolios, and it's always been a disconnect for me to have um, the use of indexes and ETFs in a portfolio, especially since I'm attracted to inve managers who invest from a fundamental approach. But there you yeah, are. Is, is that they, lazy? Is that just a, a, well, a cheap way to head? Or? Yeah. Or, or I think it's, sometimes it's lack of sophistication because, like, if you, for example, if you have the retail ETF, I don't know the percentage now, but Walmart used to be disproportionately large in the retail ETF. So that means effectively you're, you're saying you have a bet on Walmart, but you don't own Walmart, you own the ETF, which is disproportionately impacted by Walmart. So it's, it, it's, it's actually almost naive, I think, or unsophisticated, surprisingly, from those that are supposed to be very sophisticated managers. Right. B besides... The style drift we were just talking about, uh, what would be the, the number one reason you've fired managers outside of performance in, in your careers? Uh, I fired one due to lack of disclosure. Um, since East Street has been around, we've made one redemption. Uh, what, what was the lack of disclosure? In, in oh, it's a long story. Loose, well, it's maybe a good one, if it's, it's too complicated. Got time. But it wasn't um, around it fees was, or no, 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 investments. Not at all. Um, 
in first quarter of 17, their worst performing name in the portfolio. They wrote about it in their letter because they always gave updates on all the names in their portfolio. Second quarter of 17, the name was doing better. They wrote about it in their second quarter letter. The first week of July, which is the first week of the third quarter, the company breached a covenant with their creditor, who was Cerberus. And when the second quarter letter came out, they wrote that the company was doing better because on, as of June 30th, the company was doing better. We got their July number. Their July number was a disaster. This one company was a large portion of the down. And when I asked them what happened, they said that they explained what happened. And I said, but why didn't you disclose it? And they said, oh, because the quarter ended on June 30th, and this didn't happen until July. And so every quarter, when I read the update on all the names in the portfolio, I never trusted that things were going as well as they were going. And so I finally just had to pull the trigger because I didn't believe their letters anymore. Got it. So sort of trickiness with transparency. What else besides performance would cause you to go through a divorce? Uh, I'll say it won't exactly fire, but a red flag that we have noticed a few times is just you know, higher concentration in positions or bets. And it can come from either side. Like sometimes it could be you have a manager who has performed really well and uh, gained too much confidence, get overconfident, and can make bigger bets. And we have seen it on the other side as well, where a manager has underperformed too much, and now they need to catch up. So now they're going to pile up on one factor or one bet. Uh, so that's a red flag that we should be on the lookout for. That's a good one. I mean, we've watch list also to, we've watched lists of two managers um, due to organizational issues. In both cases, uh, the PM fired senior analysts, and um, we just wanted to make sure that everything was you know, if they hired somebody new, if they, in one case they hired two new, in another case they hired nobody new, that everything was back on track, and there are one and two best performing managers this year, so. Well, uh, the elephant in the room is size, is, is asset growth, AUM growth. Uh, no, no, that's true. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and it's not to say that, that we've seen, there's many successful uh, managers out there with large assets, and they, do a really great job managing it, but they're in big names. And so it, it definitely, um, you know, uh, narrows their investment universe over time. And if, you, if you're in an environment where you have fewer stocks uh, in the universe to, to, to trade and to invest in, combined with only being in big cap stocks, you know, there's, where's the value in being in, in a manager that can add value through, you know, the long short side, because then the short side becomes difficult, and on and on and on. But it's sort of well known. I, so yeah, I mean, I agree with Liz in terms of you have to be careful that managers aren't just overcapitalized and working towards their management fee and not the incentive fee and what aligns investors in the hedge fund structure. So definitely that. Though I, I would just, and, and again, having come from a small emerging manager specialist prior to my current firm, um, I, I would just say though, I think each has its advantages and disadvantages. In other words, there, you know, with the, the, one of the advantages of size is um, that, that one can be in more geographies, one can invest in more opportunity sets, one can invest in opportunity sets that have much higher um, capital or uh, labor requirements, so to speak, meaning team requirements, where, you know, if, if you want, there, there are investment strategies that you need resources for to implement that can be very successful. And if you're a small emerging manager, you might not have those resources. So I think size is a double-edged sword. I think there's an argument for small, I think there's an argument for large, and I think just as with anything, at the end of the day, it's really, you just have to be careful that you're in the right managers within the size. What are some other tips for LPs in trying to get beyond the pitch book and the wonderful first date meeting with a manager? I mean, go ahead. No, go ahead. I mean, I think it has to start with the pitch book. You have to start somewhere. Um, and people say, you know, does performance matter? And I said, well, if you've never met the manager before, and you have to, again, you have to start somewhere. If someone's been around for five years and they've done mediocre for five years, then there's really no reason to go there. Um, but I think that, I think for me, like getting beyond, you know, the pitch book in the first meeting, it's just you really have to, I guess a lot of the pitch books look the same because they're created by the same three people. Um, but I think one of them is a former, former colleague of mine. Yeah, but I think, you know, so I think that um, it's really, what's their strategy? You know, for us it's, you know, what's their size? 
how long is their track record, um, how do they handle difficult times in the market, because all of our managers have been around, so we can see how they've done in difficult times. Um, but, I mean, you do have to start somewhere. Um, and as long as they do what fits in what you're looking for, then the more you meet, you know, the bigger selection you have, like we say about the managers, the more stocks they have to choose from, the better their selection is going to be. Well, same with us. Yeah, yeah I was going to say the ex exactly the same point. More options you have, the, the, so even if you look at really good numbers uh, that a manager has posted over a few years, and we had seen some examples of those, uh, if the, the investment process of the manager doesn't have enough breadth of investment uh, options, we are not confident that this this uh, performance will continue in future, because uh, you know even if you have a really good manager with a you know, scale of say or hit ratio of 55 percent, if he has just one decision to make, it can go either way. And mathematically, it's you know, denoted by the formula: information ratio equal to information quotient uh, coefficient multiplied by square root of breadth. And that breadth is really important because you, you know you need enough coin flips from a bias coin to be successful from it. Uh, so you know, it's a diversification kind of point too that you, know, you need to be diversified across multiple alpha generating factors to be able to successful and to be confident that this performance will replicate in future. Okay. I would just add, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, we, we, we do, you, you joked earlier that we get 100 pitches a day. I mean, we look at, we, I look at all of them, in other words. I, I, I may spend a few, you know, sort of Malcolm Gladwell, a few seconds, like, flipping over the fact sheet or the pitch book. But, you know, at, like all of us have been doing this for so long, I think you have a pretty good sense as to whether something's interesting to you or not or what you're looking for potentially or not pretty quickly. And, you know, it, yeah, I mean, if someone's got a five-year track record, unless you have some reason to believe something's immensely different and it's not very good, why would you bother, right? Um, so, you know, but we do respond to all managers it, via email, not phone, but email. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if, it, it, go ahead, listen. Uh, I was, go ahead if you want to ask another question or. Well, but uh, maybe it relates. I'm, I'm wondering if, if any of you would share a story about a, a time going through due diligence with, with a manager that you ultimately decided not to invest in, that you look back on very fondly and said, I'm very proud of the process I ran and ultimately finding something that avoided a catastrophe? Uh, I want, you probably have, you guys probably have a, a good story, but I would just add to the whole, you know, the whole process of how you identify managers and how do you, how do you fine, fine tune the, the names that you're going to look at. And uh, it's much more qualitative, but, you know, reference checking and pedigree and in the old, you know, I think all of us have been around long enough that uh, LinkedIn never wasn't always around, and so we had our own ways of creating our own LinkedIn that was incredibly valuable and still is valuable in terms of trying to understand the, the, the where the manager is coming from, you know what motivates them, you know what, how do they worked in other environments, do they have the, you know so doing the whole reference checking it's a lot of work, it's not just reference checking for the managers that the names that they give you, but you know using your 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 own you know your own network of contacts. Um, which I think could lead to some stories of not doing um, uh, investing in a manager, but yeah, Liz, Liz knows my former firm and former partner very well, and that was our whole premise, right? That type of primary reference checking of official and unofficial, and right, even before LinkedIn, right? Protege. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, a funny story was once we were about to bring a manager to. In investment committee, um, and this is a couple firms ago, and uh, all of a sudden we asked them, we, we were there and the manager was out, but the CFO was there, and we said, oh, by the way, what are your exposures? And they were way in excess of what we had understood the range to be. And I, I, I just, you know, we just said, you know, we're, we're pulling our rep recommendation to move this forward because this is way beyond our expectations and uh, is much more aggressive than we'd expected. And uh, that firm has been, is very well known. It's uh, on the West Coast. It's, it's, um, uh, multiple, it, it, well, I don't know what the assets are today, but it's been multiple billion at one point, and it's, it's been volatile over history, so I think it was not, I think it was the right decision. I, um, last year around this time, uh, decided not to invest in a manager for operational reasons. Um, they actually failed an operational due diligence review. Um, part of the fail was um, 
I asked them, you know, they were preparing their DDQ and they told me they would get it to me and I kept asking and asking and I'm still waiting. <laughs> wow. It sounds like you've, you've figured out something very shrewd through I investor letters. Um, the, the example you're talking about before with disclosure and kind of a technicality around dates. It, it, are there any other tips uh, for folks in the audience about once you've hired what you think is a great manager, how to process all the information they're giving you? Uh, but m my experience as a reporter is that it, it's, it's not an outright lie that's going to happen. It's, it's selective truths that end up misleading. So, you know, is there a way, do you have any best practices for reading the, the quarterly letters or the, the performance data that they're sending in on how to parse that to go beyond what they're, the image they're presenting, essentially? Well, just to, take the, just to make the panel more interesting and take the other side of what you two are saying, again, having been on the manager side, it, you know, it... It, it, it may or may not have been nefarious or intention to deceive, and if it was, that's what? not good. It actually, it was intentional. Okay, they um, one PM said that they, he thought that they should disclose it, and another PM said no. So it was intentional. Okay, because what I was going to say is, if you're writing these letters, it can get very confusing. Like, if, you, if, the if the quarter ends here, and then you start sometimes including here, and then sometimes not, it can get very confusing. And, it, you know, so if, if there was any unethical behavior and, and, and nefarious, or they, like you're saying, if it was in intentional, but some firms do stop time, like and say the quarterly letter is through March, through June, and, and anything subsequent you speak to clients about, of course, on the phone or put in the next letter, but that, I would just give that defense there. I just listened to a podcast yesterday. Um, there's a investor named Judd Reese of, mm -hmm. si Judd Reese of Sire Partners. He's been, he has a small fund of funds and he was interviewed. And he quoted, I don't know who he quoted, but the, the essence of the quote was, if you tell the truth, then you don't have to remember what you said. And so, you know, the, the whole idea of communication is, is paramount, I think, in what we do for due diligence. And when you're working with a manager, whether before you invest or even more importantly, after you invest, the more you can share with your investor about what's going on, the better off you're going to be. And then if you, if, if, if we all understand where you're coming from, what's happened in the portfolio, what's happened to a position, and you make a legitimate, you know, discussion of it, and more often than not, I think you're going to get, you're going to stay, remain a manager in the portfolio, or continue to be evaluated as a manager. It's pretty. It doesn't sound very, you know, enlightening, but I think it, sometimes we have to remind ourselves that communication is what it's all about, in my opinion. And I would say in. The how do you know, once you've invested with the manager and you said, you know, we get these monthly data sheets, compare them month to month. Make sure there's no dramatic changes, um, which sometimes there can be, which is fine, but just make sure you know about it. Because um, you'll be amazed what those data sheets actually show um, and how many people don't really pay attention to what it's saying. And you can find some pretty interesting things going on in a portfolio. Yeah, I would add it's the same at the corporate level with companies. When I was an analyst and portfolio manager, it, various firms, uh, Morgan Stanley and Soros and Credit Suisse. Um, same thing with companies. I mean, corporate management, one month they're reporting this metric or statistic, and the next month they're not, or they're reporting it differently. So I was an analyst, too. And what makes it easier when you're analyzing a company is in your models, you have all the, you have all the data from quarter to quarter lined up in front of you, where for us on the monthly sheets, the last month's data isn't there. Right. So you actually have to go back and look at it. Yes. So I, I have a, um, it's not, it's not very, it's a pretty simple thing, but when I had the fund of funds, we would, um, as a group, you know, we have to come up with a monthly NAV. And, you know, you've done a tremendous amount of, of work on the manager, so you should know that manager pretty well. You should know pretty well by the end of the month where that manager is going to come out in terms of performance. And so I think one of the things we used to do is that we'd estimate, and, you know, you can use Bloomberg and 13Fs and all that, th all that to help you figure out what that return would be. And then when you get the return, if there's a big difference in the return, either we screwed up in the way we thought about that manager and the way they invested, or something happened in the portfolio that's new to us. And so you, then that triggers additional conversations and trying to figure it out. And that's actually saved us in a lot of times um, in terms of trying to under, stay ahead of an issue. Yeah. Uh, uh how do you parse the, the portfolio manager who has 
a, a great big bet on something, and it seems really sophisticated. It's the market is telling them they're wrong for now, but they're convinced that it will ultimately pay off. How, how do you parse someone being, you know, stubborn and just doubling down on a bad idea, versus persistence in the face of market irrationality? There's a very fine line between being early and being wrong. Right. Um, I mean, we hire it, these we hire these managers because we have faith in them. Um, if going and having this really really large position is not out of what they've done in the past, um, where they tend to have maybe one or two really large bets in the portfolio at a time, then you have to you know believe in them. If it's something that they've never done before, and all of a sudden they have a 10% position, but before then the largest position they've ever had is 5%, and they're saying that this is different, we know. Well, then you have to goes back to the style drift thing, but you know we hire these managers for the thought of being with them for a long time, and we hire them because we trust them. We can find out quickly that we've been wrong. But I think if I saw this position where they kept thinking they were right, I would need to hear from them, explain to me why it's not working, and explain to me why your thesis says that it's going to work. And I'd like to think, and you could probably think the same way, that my time as being an analyst, I can think that way and think, do I buy into what they're saying? Because I used to do this for a living too. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, have, I think what you're saying is you have to contextualize it. If it's expected from a manager to have multiple large positions, then, you know, then it's expected. And if it's, they all aren't going to work at the same time, usually, or, off, or, or there will be periods where they don't all work at the same time. And so I, I think you really have to contextualize it into how often was it expected, um, how many, you know, if it's only one that's not working and others are, maybe it's not so bad. Um, you know, again, how much history do you have with the manager? How much confidence, do, hopefully you have a lot of confidence if you're invested with a manager. Yeah. Okay. Um, l lastly, a, a, a topic I, I want to bring up that, that I know you want to talk about, Mike, is uh, ESG or environmental, social, and governance factors for managers. It seems like on the hedge fund side, there's a little more awareness and, and use of, of ESG criteria in making their investments. Do you all think that's a, a, a fad that doesn't really impact returns, or is it a very healthy um, new way of looking at a portfolio? Do you want me to start? Or? Sure, sure. So yeah, I mean, our, it's very it's crucial to our firm, and at our firm, when we look at any investment in our fiduciary duty, it's return, risk, cost, or fees, and and ESG. So it's it's one of the four pillars of what we from you know it, or or in our prism of when we look at every investment. So and including in, in these managers that we're talking about. So the managers have to have an ESG policy. Um, they have to abide by our exclusion list, which is, pub which is publicly listed on our website, which is tobacco, uh, nuclear weapons, and cluster bombs. And then ideally, they're contributing to the UN SDIs and SDGs, the Social Development Initiatives and Goals. So um, you know, if managers are interested in capital from us, this is something they can't take lightly. OK. So we, we, we just have five minutes left. I, I want to do a quick lightning round of questions where I annoyingly force you all into very quick answers to some hot button topics. Maximum uh, two sentences, yeah? Uh, well, r really just a couple words. So I'm going to be hopefully ruthless here. The best performing hedge fund strategy in 2020 will be, um, Multi strategy. Multi strat. Okay, it's sort of a non answer. But Macro. Go ahead. Macro, okay. Long short equity, of course. Long short equity? I say um, life sciences, long okay. short. Okay. Health. Excellent. Worst performing hedge fund strategy of 2020. We'll, we'll go back to Liz for 300. I don't really have a strong view, but I think emerging markets is going to be challenging as e always. EM equity or yeah. just, e just EM, EM general? Okay. I don't have a view. I pay attention to one thing. <laughs> Well, I'll say emerging markets broadly. Emerging markets, okay. Uh, long bias, long short. Long bias, long short. Okay. Um, the most overused hedge fund manager sales pitch today. Is it quantum mental? Oh. Is it black yeah. box? Quantum mental, artificial intelligence, okay. all data. Okay. Um, artificial intelligence, do we see a, a, a lot Okay, of use of AI, all right. I think quantum mental. Quantum mental. Yeah, or, you know, there's always a word out there, and I'm trying to think of the word that I've been listening. Deviant perception? 
No. Variant? Yeah, variant? Variant perception. Variant perception. Variant perception. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> variant perception. Um, wh wh what is Versus the most the common deep. mistake made by LPs? Is it falling in love with a, a sharp ratio, a, a smooth personality? What, what's the number one lurking danger? Recency bias. Recency bias. Excellent. What? What? Recency bias in performance. Chasing returns. Chasing returns. Some more? Chasing returns and then redeeming at the bottom. Okay, we have a trend. Will you forth that or? No. No. Uh, no. Best risk metric for evaluating a manager? Just one. Just one. Information ratio. Okay. Gain loss ratio. Up capture, down capture. I say the same thing, yeah. Okay, consensus. Um, uh, ESG, uh, FAD, or um, Im important development? Important development. Important, okay. I don't think you'd be that. Okay, important. I'm going to have to go with important development. Okay. Important, but hard to institute. Okay. <laughs> um, w expected percentage return for your hedge fund portfolio next year, 2020. Net of fees. Ten percent, twenty, five. Zero to five. Zero to five. Wow, low. Okay. Uh, this is my personal view. I would think good hedge funds next year could do five to ten. Five to ten. Okay. Tell me what the Russell's going to do, and then I'll give you a number. What? Can you be Tell more specific? Tell me what the Russell's going to do, and then I'll give you a number. Yeah. Well, what do you think the Russell's going to do? Up single digits. Single digits. Okay, Liz. We're Same. I was going to say five to seven percent. Wow. Okay. Given that you know equities and bonds are, ble you know, there's a premium there. Okay. So, so we have a single digit kind of cautiously optimistic, and and last last lightning round question. Last question for the panel is, if you had one word one word to describe sort of your mood for the hedge fund investment industry next year, what would it be? Lukewarm. Lukewarm? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> optimistic. 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 Cautiously optimistic. Cautiously optimistic. <laughs> All right. Oh, right. <laughs> Great. Well, I, I think that is, uh, our, I've exhausted our panelists sufficiently today, but I, I hope you'll join me in thanking them for a, a great conversation.